August brings the sheaves of corn, then the harvest home is born. Welcome to August and to the broadcast. This is the first broadcast of the month of August and in that spirit it's time for me to remind you to press subscribe if you wish to subscribe. If you have found yourself accidentally unsubscribed, press the button immediately. Thank you. August is a wild card month, particularly here in the Kingdom, because the royal family recede and retreat to Scotland and other places, have a bit of a holiday here and there. Parliament rests and uh, so I don't know what's going to crop up and we haven't got Catherine to gossip about either very much, she's not around much. So we will see what happens in August. I will keep coming to my dears but as usual you will have to be patient enough or should I say respectful enough, enough to let the river meander wherever it meanders my dear and I make no apology for it, we'll see, but sometimes it takes us to some weird places, you know some whimsical places and I'm going to start uh, with a little whimsy of mine and uh, it's on the subject of coffee thank you by the way to those of you who sent me a uh, treat treated me to a cup of coffee I appreciate it now that I'm back on the stuff after seven months of no coffee and no goodies at all yes as I told you on Monday I had my very first sip of a cup of morning joe and I started off with de decaffeinated. But don't misunderstand me, my dear. That was just to check that my system was going to be okay, having been so pure for seven months. I wanted to check that I wasn't, wasn't going to set me off, you know. And it was absolutely fine. So a couple of days later, I went on to the proper, full-blooded caffeine, my dears. But I've been taking it black. I've been taking it Americano, shop bought. And I don't like plain black coffee. I really have to be in the mood for it or have a serious hangover for, for plain black coffee. I like it slightly blanched with double cream. And I mean just a smidgen, just a whisper of it. Actually I take a teaspoon and I use less than a teaspoon. I dip it into the double cream which is for those of you abroad in the States it's the, the equivalent of a heavy cream or a heavy whipping cream but it's thicker than that actually. It's particular to the kingdom. And you stick it in there uh, the teaspoon in there and without really doing anything else to it then you just stick it uh, into the black liquid of the Americano and it blanches the mixture and it, it changes things with that wonderful alchemical talent that it has of doing it. It changes into something a little bit more yummy but of course it's not the most exciting drink in the world. Well this is, this is the kind of way that I drag up life and I make Theatre out of life, my dear. I wanted to give it a name. You have ristretto, you have you know latte, cappuccino, all these different fancy coffees. I wanted my own name for this particular, this particular black coffee, with a hint of cream. So I I conjure up a name for it, my dear. The black part of it, the coffee part of it, the americano, which must be store bought. It must be store bought, not brewed at home, to make it my concoction. Uh, that part is the Devereux. And then the <laughs> and then the, the the cream part of it that goes in that is the blanche you see or the blanche that is the blanche and together when you dip the cream into the black mixture it becomes the blanche Devereux you understand my dear? the blanche Devereux as invented by me and you ha it has to be made exactly that way or it's not a Devereux. Okay, so if you brew it up yourself uh, and you add cream and then some honey, that's not a Blanche Devereux. It might be your affair and you can call it whoever you want, my dear. You can call it Dorothy, Rose, or what's the Estelle? Sophia, you can call it whatever, but it's not a Blanche Devereux. No. Uh, and this is the way that I dress up life, my dear, because it, it gives me, you know, I feel that I'm there sipping morning coffee with the gals when I conjure it up. I'm like, I've got to trot off to the shops to buy my Devereux, but it's just not complete until with the addition of the Blanche. It's a wonderful, uh, for those of you who don't understand, uh, uh, Blanche is, of course, the Rue McClanahan character in The Golden Girls. I'm sure most of you know that, my dear, the iconic character. But no, plain coffee without any sort of dairy at all just doesn't fulfill me in any way. I need that little smidgen of cream. And King Cozy Socks has been kicking off his morning with a dram, a wee dram of something the other night. I really don't think that it was coffee. This was at the May Games, where the King joined spectators in watching traditional Highland sports, including the hammer throw, 
the sheaf toss and the stone put and he presented a trophy to the winning tug of war team. King Charles is the chieftain of the games and wore a traditional kilt and this was at St John O'Groats Park and the king was braced by acquaintances and aquaries such as Johnny Thompson there in the background and here's a sweet photograph of the king at Balmoral in 1951. The tradition to be in their beloved Scotland over the summer of course dates back a very long time and reports are telling us that Catherine will indeed make the journey to travel to Balmoral to join the King and of course the rest of the Waleses over summer so that's rather good news as is custom and there are also rumours that before that time there will be members of the royal family joining Princess Anne in Paris at the events of the Olympics that are taking place this week so let's keep our eyes peeled. Today on the CBS Sunday morning show who did we have rock up? The Harkles. What did you think of their performance? Megan looked like a prison janitor. She sculpted on in there, yanking up those pants up to her rib cage. With the hair tresses pulled forward, pulling them all forward, and the outfit was courtesy of the Ralph Lauren collection, the Adrian relaxed fit linen blend shirt in mauve. That is how they describe it, not me. But it's in mauve. Actually, I've worn that shade exactly uh, before here on the broadcast and I did wear it better. I've got to tell you, I did wear it better. It was a lot prettier, but she does her best. She does her best. And they were there to launch the Parents' Initiative. <laughs> and she spoke about her kids, aged three and five as they are, and how they want to protect their children. And of course, there was a lot of very worthy talk. There was actually some very moving talk from the parents of children and people who had a hard time online and ended up finishing their lives, which was extremely sad to hear about. And I'm very appreciative if Harry and Meghan are raising awareness in this arena, if awareness needs to be raised, although I do have some criticisms on this subject too. They speak about wanting to protect the online space, say there's lots of work to be done there and they're happy to be part of the change for good. Well, you can be part of that change for good. Love a boy and love a girl. If you don't encourage merchants of hate to begin with. And we've trodden this ground a few times, but it doesn't seem to be getting through to you, does it? You could start by making a huge tidal wave of relief for many people by pointing out and dismissing from your charges those, for example, various Twitter lords who bully the royal family, including your own brother and sister-in-law, including tabloid biographer grifters and including yourselves. Because those three avenues of hate spring more or less from the confines of the Casa of the Riven Rock in Montecito, don't they? So you could put a stop to that yourselves to begin with before patronizing and condescending to everybody else and accuse everybody else from manufacturing hate and merchandising hate when you are more guilty of it than anybody else. You don't see it, do you? You don't see that it applies to you just as vividly. And body language theorists have been having a field day as usual, suggesting that Meghan is more dominant in the dynamic of their relationship. Well, it doesn't take any sort of body language theorist to tell us that, does it, my dear? We can all see that, but I noticed it as well. And it's been said that when Harry and Meghan attend events together, you will notice Meghan looking into Harry's eyes to signal when it's time to move on. A big power gesture. It shows him who the boss is and that she makes the final call. I see that and I also, I've got to tell you, I also see a sort of weariness and irritation in Meghan's eyes with Harry when he interjects. She's like, oh yes, I've got to pretend to listen to him now. You know, uh, I see that very obviously. And she uses her eyes like the claw, the restraining hand, 
whatever she's doing, there has to be some sort of elasticity, some elastic energy between them, doesn't there, to keep them in check. Down boy, down boy. Good, you get it. I'll give you a biscuit. Home cooked from my new cookery show, Cooking the Books. Oh yes, a special doggy biscuit for you, Harry. From American Riviera Orchard. Yes, she uses those eyes to coax and goad and warn and make all sorts of signals and indications with. And she uses them like she uses pats as well, you know, and she ushers him along in the event. Okay, I've done my bidding. You, you can shut up now, Harry. Oh, let me just gently coax you in this time. Get moving! Get moving, Harry! You see it all the time. She won't allow him to have his say. Move on, move on. So there is that. And now we find out that there is also going to be a further addition, a further leg to the worldwide privacy tour. Here it comes. Brace yourself, Columbia. Brace yourself, my dears, and please let me know if we have any Colombian basketeers in the fruit basket below. Let me know. Are you looking forward to this cod regal visit? This so-called royal tour at the invitation of your vice president, Francia Marquez, who says, I am pleased to announce that Prince Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, have kindly accepted my invitation to visit our beautiful country. They'll be engaging with leaders, youth and women who embody the aspirations and voices of Colombians committed to progress and they will be enjoying the vibrant locations of the land. Well, I'm quite jealous, actually. I've never been there. But I've got a few friends from there, actually. And I wouldn't mind going, so I'm quite jealous. As you know, Harry considers Britain far too terrifying and too dangerous and too much of a risk to bring the Duchess to. Well, any excuse, it doesn't matter. I'm just absolutely elated and delighted that he's found a reason not to bring her here. But of course, that's all sophistry. The reason he won't bring her here is because the girl's petrified of getting booed. Booed! Booed and hissed. Everything has to be so expertly curated and stage managed to try and avoid it when the likes of Catherine and William don't have that luxury. And the King and Queen, they face the crowds, even with all the Republican protesting and security threats, they face them, they face up to it, my dear, and go shaking hands and pressing palms. But not for the precious Duke and Duchess, they don't. But they're going to be scuttling along to Colombia, lucky Colombia. We have not been furnished with a date for this visit. That would be too much given away by the Harkers. They want to cossack that sort of information for themselves, don't they, my dear, so that they can ambush the press at the right time in a flurry of activity. And while they're there, they could also be picking up some wonderfully, wonderfully unadulterated white gold, couldn't they? You know, Meghan and Harry, they love their jewels. They love their jewels, so... Some white gold could be on the, on the horizon, freshly harvested. Because that white gold is so pure and so good and unadulterated. That white snow, uh, sorry, that white gold of Colombia. Actually, I wouldn't mind a sniff myself. I mean, I wouldn't mind a gem or two myself. Ah! Mad Hatter says, hello, Rivet. So good of you to do a broadcast when you're so hot and uncomfortable. I know it is, isn't it? It's very good of me. Bless you. Have you tried sage drops? They are fantastic for overheating women of a certain age. Years back, I gave some to a friend who suffered horrendously and he stopped sweating within about 10 minutes of taking them. They're called A. Vogel Menesan sage drops. Put about 14 drops into a third of a glass of water and bingo. Also, there's a fantastic company making cooling underwear <laughs> called Become. They work miracles too. Worth a try. Well, Mad Hatter, I don't know if you're peeing on my leg or if your comment was serious, but I'm going to take it as if you were being serious. Uh, so I thank you for the comment. It is the first time, I must admit, that I have had a recommendation of pastilles designed for menopausal ladies of a certain age, it's the first time. And I only get my hot flushes during a broadcast uh, while I'm filming. That's the only time when it gets overwhelming, my dear. 
That's why I never want advice on how to keep cool. I know how to keep cool. If I wanted aircon, I'd get ugly old aircon. I don't. I know how to open a window and I'm surrounded by these little fans. And I've got larger fans, but these do the trick so well. And I've mentioned them for two or three years on the trot. I picked these up at John Lewis, but you can buy them wherever. They're very good from John Lewis. Wonderful, uh, multi-speed little fans. And you can prop them up like this on the desk. I have them on me all day. Actually, I was using it the other day on the tube and then by train. And uh, for some reason, I had a pair of my earplugs on me. Now, they are the greatest invention that was ever born into existence, earplugs. I've always been a light sleeper. Anything wakes me up. They saved my life. They're amazing. I use a fresh pair every single day because I buy them in multi-packs of about 500, little orange squishy ones. They go in and you go into a sort of cocoon and I sleep very well and get used to them. But I wore them out and about the other day. I found a pair in my bag and I ended up wearing them on the tube and the train. I might have worn them on the train before, but I wore them on the tube and it made such a difference to my journey because the tubes can get very hot and very crowded and there's various noises. And it's wonderful because you can still pick up as you can still pick up the noise from alarm clocks or if people are having a conversation with you, even if you're wearing these earplugs, you can still, it still gets through to you somehow, but you don't get the, the further afield ambient noises. And it was the same with these. I could still hear over the tannoy. I could still hear what I needed to hear, but it gave that wonderful muffling. So I recommend those little fans. I recommend earplugs as the best invention ever in the world. And I'm not sure I'll ever get round to using your sage drops and the other thing that you recommended, Mad Hatter. But the suggestion or the recommendation is there for other viewers who might be going through hot flashes and need a little sensible hand. Uh, from both sexes, according to you, it worked for your male friend. So there's something for you to give a go if you want to. But as for the underwear range, the cooling underwear range by Become, uh, I don't wear ladies' undercrackers as a general rule, my dear. <laughs> it might surprise you to know. But no, I'm not into women's underwear other than, admittedly, well, not that you need to force the confession out of me. I'm happy to tell you. I've told you many times in the broadcast that I rather like to wear lingerie uh, for gentlemen or rough men. Whatever takes my fancy, my dear. But yes, you know, heels and a teddy suit and a pair of stockings. That's all fine, my dear. That's all very well and good. That's all feast for the banquet, but not support knickers. I draw the line at support knickers and cooling bras. And the Princess Royal has been all over the shop in Paris at the Olympics with visits to GB House, offering encouragement and guidance for the team. A message from Kitty who says, River, whilst I love your channel, I am calling you out, sir, with King Charles and his love of the World Economic Forum. I generally love your right-leaning politics, sir, and agree with you on most subjects, but how could you love our royal family, being as globalist and lefty-leaning that they are in that respect? I would be interested to hear your views as I, a British middle-class housewife, have gone right off our Charlie boy, having researched his affiliation with Klaus and crew. What say you, sir? Our late Queen would never have affiliated herself with such dubious creatures, would she? I can no longer be a monarchist with his disgusting friends if he keeps really not for the people, is he? Firstly, it's refreshing to hear you uh, refer to yourself as a housewife, my dear. Wonderful word. The best word for it, being replaced by all sorts of ridiculous things. It's like replacing teacher with educator. Entirely unnecessary. Or cleaning lady. And yes, I know there are cleaning men as well or cleaning lady being replaced by cleaning operative. Actually, I prefer char, but call me old fashioned. Well, Kitty dear, your comment sums up the feelings of many fruit basketeers, actually, and royal watchers. As many fans as we have of the king, and I consider myself an admirer in many ways, not of everything, but of a lot. Uh, we also have many who disparage him for similar, have, they have similar criticisms as you. Uh, I tend to cut him a lot of slack because he does have to tread very difficult lines. He lives and reigns in a very different time to the late Queen. 
Where there is less mystery, there is more daylight thrown upon magic by necessity, more interaction with the people. And in many respects, he is damned if he does, and he's damned if he doesn't in relation to all kinds of things, some of them controversial. It is a tightrope. And he gets, as well as being accused of being a great big lefty, as you have done, my dear, which is not how I see him, actually, he is also similarly accused of being right-leaning by those on the left. Do you understand, my dear? It depends what news you digest, where you look to for your sources, and also how you filter the conversation yourself. His true position uh, remains a mystery, of course, but it, I would say is likely a mixture of influences from the right or left, which is rather like my own, actually. You say that I strike you as right-leaning, and I would agree with that, although there was a time then I would have considered myself totally centrist, and at heart I still do, but there are leanings towards the right, you are, you are correct to say that. But I also grew up admiring many of the ideals of the left, and shunning some of the more older ideals of the right. There was a redressing of the balance that was required, as there always will be. But on the spectrum, uh, the scale, I suppose you could say, of left and centre and right, it won't have escaped your notice that that scale, that spectrum, has slid to the left rather dramatically in recent years. It has repositioned itself so that what was once centre is now right, and what was once considered right is now far right, which is being flung around the kingdom at all quarters at the moment, and you'll know that if you are here with recent events that I'm not going to discuss today, but we've edged towards before, but it's far right this and far right that, for having really rather reasonable views. Absurd, absolutely absurd what's going on. You ask how can I love the royal family? being the lefty globalists that you see them as. Well, I love many left-leaners, many left-leaners. I don't preclude those who lean to the left from my love. I might be frustrated and I might be at odds with their positions on things, but if I wanted all of my social circle to echo my own sentiments and sing from the same hymn sheet as me, then I would join the church choir, metaphorically speaking. And for those of you who do lean to the right and are looking for a forum, Peter Whittle's New Culture Forum appears excellent to me. I might have mentioned it before recently, but there's a YouTube channel for it as well. The New Culture Forum throws up some very interesting discussions. There'll be some faces that are familiar to some of you, such as Rafe Handelman Koo, and there is Alexander Pitt, and all kinds of contributors, and it's not partisan, but it points and directs towards those of us who wish to uphold and protect tradition and culture with a small c conservatism, you understand? But I'm going to tell you in all honesty, when it comes to the matters that I see other people posting about, and you've mentioned such as the WEF, the World Economic Forum, and climate change, and globalism, and all these things that are controversial, I'm going to be very honest with you and say that these issues are very polarizing but my own opinions are very jejune and really rather ignorant on all of these subjects or should I say not educated to the degree that I would be comfortable enough to say that I am confident in them. Part of that reason is because I'm very open-minded and I will listen with just as much vigor to those who are passionately for and passionately against such things as net zero and climate change, to try and give me the breadth of experience from all over, but it can leave one sitting on the fence for a very long time. And sometimes that is where I end up with these sort of issues. I'm not confident enough in my issues. Whereas King Charles might be right or wrong, I might agree, might disagree, might have a jejun, uninformed opinion, but King Charles is highly educated, and I think he is very discerning. I know that he is compassionate. He's not perfect, but that is one of the reasons why he is compassionate, because he's failed, and because he has fallen from dramatic heights in front of the world more than once. He is extremely well-read and learned in a variety of fields, and he engages with all types of leaders and heads of state, 
farmers, those in the agricultural world, eco-scientists or not, with royalty from all over the world, with artisans, extraordinarily well connected, extraordinarily uniquely well placed to receive information, I think uniquely. His life is a tapestry of 75, 76 years of meeting people. That's what he does. And many of those people are experts at their field, at the top of their professions. And I don't believe that Charles is stupid enough to try and harbour some sort of echo chamber. I believe that he's someone who would listen to all kinds of people and pull together his own ideas. It doesn't mean that I agree with everything or surrender my own opinions to his, but in a way I do defer and place some trust in his judgment. I will admit that, I do. But regardless of which way he leans, uh, if you are correct and he does lean further towards the left side of the lollipop at this moment in time, well, he better understand that when it comes to the hot topic issue of mass immigration at speed, for example, from countries who have an attitude that is hostile to our own culture, our traditions and our land, uh, he is facing the death knell for monarchy in the not too distant, the closer than expected future, the death knell, because it's a numbers game. What we're facing is a numbers game and as soon as we become the mon minority, those of us who are inspired by the traditional culture of Christianity and the Church of England, as soon as we become the minority, then it's game over, not only for us, but for the royal family. So they're living on borrowed time. Sarah Claro, dear River, although I know you are not a fan of Kia Starmer, two tier Kia, as he is coming to be known here in the kingdom, two-tier policing, evident for the world to see, two-tier Kia. Who, uh, no, do you have any opinion about Lady Victoria Starmer? Well, rap on the knuckles, my dear, she is not Lady Victoria Starmer, she's Lady Starmer. And I'm only saying that because I made the same mistake <laughs> in the previous broadcast with Lord Robert Fellows, as I called him, and those of you who corrected me a right to do so. Of course, he is not known as that. He was Lord Fellows because he was not the son and Victoria is not the daughter of a Duke or a Marquis or an Earl. Therefore, she's not Lady Victoria, but Lady Starmer. And you say, sorry to interject, I just accidentally read a piece about her and how stylish she is, although I understand you have your reservations regarding the new Prime Minister. Does Mrs Starmer channel the royal spirit? Well, I don't know if I'll go so far as to say the royal spirit, but in actual fact she does channel something. I might even have shared this admiration for her recently after the election. but. I do believe that she does have the X factor, and I saw it very plainly the moment she arrived on Downing Street with, with Sequeer, and they go around shaking hands. With her. She's got it, he doesn't. He's the antithesis of that. Although he can be personally charming, and I happen to know that as a fact, because I've been a neighbour of his, as I've told you many times. There are many ways in which he can be endearing, but as a Prime Minister, not to me. But I do think that she has a certain it girl quality about her that makes one curious. And I think that if the mainstream media were as big as they used to be, then she would have already been a huge sensation. Yes, I think she's got it. And I think she could be a very powerful force in style. You know, what's she wearing, what's she doing? if she were to encourage it a little bit more. Whether or not she'll do that because of her natural sort of reserve is another question. But yes, their house, when they're not at Downing Street, of course, their official house is in an enclave of London that I know so well. And I've lived in many parts of London, including the south of London, but the northwest of London is where my heart is, anywhere between sort of Camden Town and Hampstead and everywhere in between. I've lived <laughs> throughout that sort of thread in many places. But one of those places is the, the enclave, where I won't name the actual street. I, I'm sure it's probably public, 
public knowledge, but I mean literal neighbours to them. And the pub that I've mentioned a few times here on the broadcast, the Pineapple Pub, which is literally a 20 second walk from their front door, is one of the most fantastic uh, pubs in London. It's the scene of many a crime and that particular area around Kentish Town. There's lots of articles springing up around it now because of Sir Queer and various parliamentary figures that live around there. But it's always been a haven, a cultural haven. It's always had a coolness about it. It's gentrified and it's come up gentrified but it's still got its rough edges so it doesn't get dull and boring because some of these places in London they get so gentrified and they become so beautiful that they that they lack some danger and they lack a bit of rough a bit of rough uh, and I don't like anything that gets too highfalutin and loses its character and too safe so that sort of enclave it has got some of that magic and as well as having some fabulously beautiful sort of period homes and Sukiyas is one of those which is really rather nice but there are many around that are. There are also uh, fabulous green spaces. You know, Hampstead Heath is a very short walk away from there where you feel like you're out in nature. So you can go picnicking with your friends. It's a really lovely place for community to grow. And it, it's like many places in London, it reveals itself to you. When you first walk up there, you think, mm, this, is, this ain't much. Because uh, friends of mine lived there before I ever lived in, in those areas. And I would rock up and think, mm, it's not very special. But you get to know the places. They reveal themselves to you. And that's the magic of some of these uh, places in London, you see. But I've got many mutual friends with the Starmers. And I've brushed shoulders with them on many, many, many occasions. And I can tell you that they both have some really lovely qualities. But I can also say, in respect to so queer, to tear queer, that look like the innocent flower and be the serpent underneath it, applies in a rather visceral way to him. One may be fruity, but one is also always on royal duty, and that involves keeping a sharp eye out for any mischief makers. So with that in mind, and in that spirit, it is time for me to say cheerio for now, my dears. Ta-ta! Do let me know your thoughts below, some nice juicy comments. And if you'd like to treat me to a Blanche Devereux, then my tip chart is in the description box. <laughs> I'll see you next time, my lovies. Ta-ra and toodle pen.